Hello and welcome to the Think Bamboo podcast. I'm your host, JJ. Today, we're here with Shanti, directly from Florida, Orlando. Um, she is from Bamboo Leaf Tea. And um, it's great to have you here, Shanti. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And um, thank you for being here. And um, uh, yeah, we, we did some talking before, and it's uh, it's just amazing all um, all the the information you gave me regarding what you can do with the bamboo leaf or the bamboo um, the bamboo regarding um, tea and people and animals. So why don't you uh, uh, um, um, share with us? Um, from from your experience also um your journey to bamboo because you've been you've been uh, also very busy with bamboo since a while and and um that would be great to see how you started and then we go into what you do with bamboo yeah so i started in bamboo quite a while ago um about almost 30 years now and i was working in event management and i just i needed a change so i took a six dollar an hour job at a nursery that happened to specialize in bamboo and ornamental grasses in fact they not only specialized in them the owner was the person who introduced most of the ornamental grasses to the united states so um by luck i ended up there and from there, we I started running the landscape division program and the R&D nursery, and we were doing a project with Disney at Animal Kingdom was under construction. We were sending a lot of plants there, and I ended up working at Walt Disney Imagineering as their bamboo and ornamental grass specialist. Uh, wow. What I worked there for about four years, and I think what was really cool about it is that like it incorporated all the things that I love. So animals, plants, people, spaces, and events, right? All the things that I love about everything. And it was all in one place. And so everything at Disney is about telling the story. How well can you tell a story? How much better can you tell a story? And in an artistic way. And so we used bamboos for that to tell a story, but we also used bamboos as food for animals. And so combining those two really set kind of me in motion as to where I am now and what I do, because we had a 10 acre forage nursery where we specifically grew bamboos for forage. And that concept was then copy and pasted throughout the United States, at least, and other zoos around the world to utilize bamboo as a forage material that you grew on site. Um, and not only well, for pandas, right? Not only for pandas. Every single animal almost in Disney eats wow. bamboo or has it in their, in their containment to eat. So everything from elephants to gorillas to um, small mammals to otters, to everything. Everything eats bamboo. Wow. So it's wow. very, you know, and it has a lot of benefits. Plus it's easy to grow. And so it's a renewable resource. Animals are expensive to feed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, yeah. fast forward to where I am now, I work in, um, I do a lot of consulting around regenerative agriculture and planting around regenerative agriculture because bamboos are very good uses for people, plants and animals and for soil. And so utilizing bamboos on whether it's a quarter acre, um, homestead farm site, or it's 150 acres, or it's 500 acres, there is a use for bamboo in all of those realms and in all different um, places in the world. Right now, I live in a subtropical, I work in subtropical, tropical areas, but this is definitely pertainable to um, non-tropic areas as well. So uh, we're talking uh, kind of uh, even like uh, New York, or yeah, a little bit lower? Absolutely, because Pseudosasa japonica and some of the other temperate bamboos will go to like negative 20. So utilizing bamboos. And for us, like my specialty is really focused on the subtropics and tropics. For us, we have a lot of different issues going on. And one of the big issues in regenerative agriculture is incorporating um, lots of variety and also how do we, you know, agroforestry is about how can we 
um, add in trees, we need to cool down spaces. Mm -hmm. And one of the fastest growing plants that you can add in that's both a forage, it adds a windbreak, and it adds shade for animals is bamboos. Like we mm -hmm. can add in bamboos very quickly, very easily and affordably into spaces, even in large spaces and they can be used for a variety of different things. So there was a study done in New Zealand on um, ewes, and basically they put them in two different places, one that had three species, but all the food and water they needed, and then one that had like 30 plus species and all the food and water they needed. And then they measured the cortisol in lambs when they were born, and the, it wasn't even remarkably close. Like the ones that had more species had almost no cortisol or none. And the ones that only had three species had high elevated cortisol. That's just from diversity of species available to the animals that we eat, let wow. alone what we eat and what yeah. our babies are being, you know, have so, access to while they're mm -hmm. in vitro. So like utilizing diversification within the landscape within our farms, within our homes, within the land is really important. Wow, that's super interesting. Also, um, I just had a, a, another podcast with Juan Carlos from Bubu Bamboo uh, regarding this uh, agroforestry bamboo um, approach, which is exactly um, kind of what, what you're, you're doing there in the US, right? Or, uh, I mean, however we call it, but it's, it's about using bamboo to, to improve uh, a current um, a food uh, uh, um, setup growth, however we call it, no? And yeah. um, even more with this changing and, and complex uh, climate, a lot of rain, no rain, uh, very hot, too cold. Um, the ba also, we, we talked about that earlier, the bamboo is one of the best to adapt to uh, uh, changes and, and extreme, which the other plants are like, uh, challenging much more uh, better and and I, I think you said there also that's why or that's because of uh, or one of the things because of it is the um what's it called again silica uh, which is good silica exactly silica which mm -hmm. is which is known for nails the uh, hair beard and all that but it's much much more than just that right and yeah. um, I'm gonna start putting bamboo now in everything even when I do a soup for the dogs <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I think that um, Arif Rabi really does a great job in Bamboo Foundations of like this idea of like going back to this idea of like putting bamboos to work like in his agroforestry model, which is a version of that is an, a, a lot of different people are doing, including on Carlos, like the bamboos are working for the other plant. So the bamboos are inserted into this. And this is how I use it too. It's like the bamboos are the working plant. Like you have a working mm -hmm. dog, you have a working plant and bamboos are used and utilized for the entire rest of the farm. So they are food and medicine for the soil, for plants, for animals and for people. And so for the soil, what you're doing is, and this was really de demonstrated in your interview with Mark Peters is that um, they're using bamboos for deforested and like actually mined areas where the soil yes. is so poor that they can't grow trees back into them. So what they do is they utilize bamboos to be the, the, um, the first pioneer, pioneer yeah. plant because they're a grass, they're a pioneer species. And so they lay the way for the forest of the future which is a beautiful way to, move, to use bamboos, right? And so yeah, that yeah. is the healing of the soil because bamboos, they will, they can remediate soil. They also add biomass to soil through all of, like you're seeing behind me, these leaves keep falling down, right? It's yeah. literally beautiful. pouring down <laughs> minerals onto the ground itself and it's covering them up. More importantly, bamboos are fungal dominated meaning those funguses, and they also pat with both fungal and bacteria, the, the both, funguses yeah. and the bacteria, both. Yeah. And they, a lot of them, not just a few, but a lot of them. So they need those in order to survive. They are so intimately connected with the plant. They're almost at the nucleus. They, in fact, I've, I've seen um, people talk about how, like when plants evolve, which they do over their lifetime, that is directly affected by the funguses and bacteria, just like people, people, we are mm -hmm. like 
you know, the joke where, is like, my bacteria likes your bacteria. You want to dance, you know, like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like it's, that, plants are the same way. And so these, these fungal dominant plants and bacteria, I mean, families are both, but they have a lot of funguses. They become especially important in these pioneering type regenerative situations. And so that's why mm -hmm. they're so effective. For so many different, like everything I love about bamboo is that it is stacking things one on top of the other on top of the other, right? So it's all these stackables. So that's the soil. And for the plants, one of the best known aspects is the high silica content. So bamboo is known, it has 10 times more silica than horsetail, which is the next known one down. Mm -hmm. And horsetail is known as, um, as a tea that was used by Rudolf Steiner back in the early 1900s. So Rudolf Steiner was asked to address the over chemicalization and big ag kind of degrading of the land back in the early 1900s. Like fast forward- He was forward super to, early. <laughs> yeah, fast forward that to now, we're in a whole different game, right? You know, so they yeah. were already concerned about that. And he came up with solutions called biodynamic farming which is mm -hmm. basically or way beyond organic. And one of the, of the solutions that he created, he created these different teas and different things that you bury in the ground, all sorts of weird stuff, right, basically. Yeah. But they yeah. all now have been scientifically proved to their effectiveness in building back degraded soils. And one of them is the use of horsetail tea, which is sprayed on plants. And this was in Europe. So think there's not any bamboos in Europe. Europe is one of the few places that bamboos are not native to, right? So horsetail was the form of silica that's available. And the reason they use silica is because he intuitively know, I mean, he wasn't even, this isn't stuff that like he learned out of Google, right? He intuitively learned that silica was an antifungal and helped the plants become stronger plants. Basically what silica does is it makes the plants more resilient. It helps them survive drought. It helps them better prepare for like really wet and soggy areas. It helps to strengthen at the cellular level so that insects and funguses can't penetrate the, the cell wall. It physically changes the plant. And so they knew this all the way back in the early 1900s, and we're just starting to utilize this now. But, um, silica also increases an enzyme that's in the leaf that helps the plant, it aids the plant in breaking apart CO2, so it, it allows the plant to sequester more carbon. Um, mm -hmm. And it also increases chlorophyll. So there was a study like 30 years ago. I mean, this stuff is not new. It's just that it's been lost and found and lost and found, right? So 30 yeah. years ago, there was a study about hydroponic strawberries. And by increasing the amount of silica that was added to them, they could resist powdery mildew. So like fungal diseases and things like that can be remedied through the use of teas that are, that are high in silica, which bamboo is. So it's a really good use for plants. Um, wow. and, and making tea for plants is just as easy as making it for humans and animals, which is, is another aspect. So plants, humans, and animals, it almost acts the same way. Like when you see a bamboo plant, it's like mm -hmm. strength and then it's flexibility. So that strength and flexibility is going at the cellular level. With And when we talk about that, we're really specifically talking about silica. Bamboos mm -hmm. have a lot of minerals. They have magnesium, manganese, potassium, phosphorus, zinc, selenium. Um, they have vitamin, let's see, vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin B2, which is riboflavin, vitamin um, B6. So they have all these different minerals and vitamins. And basically what they do is people will say, oh, it's the silica that's doing hair, skin and nails, but it's really the silica in conjunction, conjunction with yeah. the magnesium, the calcium and the manganese that, you know, is the building blocks. These are all minerals are the building blocks of our body, whether you're a plant, an animal or a person. The same thing. These are the yeah. building blocks, right? So they they actually allow you to have more energy by feeding the mitochondria in the mm -hmm. cell. So it's that deep. 
silica specifically is known a lot for, like I said, hair, skin, and nails. So like on you or on your dog, it's going to make the coat shiny. It's going to make your hair grow. It's going to keep it from going gray. It's going to do all that. Um, it adds elasticity, elasticity to all the parts of your body. So, and you think of your cardiovascular system, you want elasticity in your cardiovascular system, in your Absolutely. blood vessels, in your arteries. You want that strength, you want them to hold mm -hmm. up, but you also right. want them to be flexible yeah. and really be able mm -hmm. to move. The lining of your throat, your digestive system, all your intestinal tract, these are where possibilities of things can enter into you and you know viruses or bacteria or things that your body needs to ward off we want all those cells to be strong and flexible and this is what and, silica does and silica is like the main component but it's it's the mix at the end with the other uh, minerals and all that other mix but the, right. the, is it the biggest part silica or, so, or if, if how is it how is the the setup like just to get a, a, a broad idea. Is it like 50% silica and then like the minerals, vitamins and all that, or is it? Well, as that... far as the silica, like in a cup of tea, there's 350 milligrams of silica in one eight ounce glass of tea, which is about seven times more than you even need. So silica is a water soluble element. It's best extracted through water extraction, meaning tea and it's very heat stable. Now, when you make bamboo biochar, you still have all the minerals. I mean, this is a huge benefit of bamboo mm. biochar versus other biochars, is that the minerals are very stable at high heat. And so mm -hmm. all of the minerals are still in bamboo biochar. That's what makes it so incredibly medicinal. Activated bamboo charcoal is one of the most medicinal things on the planet because mm. it can instantaneously heal like any digestive issue, food poisonings, any toxins, you can get rid of like um, overdoses, all that kind of stuff oh. can be almost instantaneously healed with bamboo biochar. And that's different oil. with timber or normal wood, you lose yeah. all that because it, it, it's because it doesn't have the sil silica, right? Bamboo biochar, whatever you make biochar or activated charcoal out of, it has in there. So trees, if you make it out of trees, it's going to represent whatever minerals that they have mm -hmm. available. And they have the thing less... about bamboo, yeah, bamboo is a more. mineral sink. It's a, mm -hmm. it's an absolute mineral sink. So, you know, bamboo shoots are a superfood. Mm -hmm. People don't often put it as that, but it is. I mean, Nirmala in India has, if you're interested in doing research, her book on bamboo shoots is mm -hmm. one is the best one out there right now. And Nirmala, she is um, works in universities doing studies. She's done the most amount of studies outside of China on bamboo shoots and their nutrition and bamboo mm -hmm. leaves. Um, so all the studies and there's been a lot done recently in the last like when I say recently in the last 10 years, because 15 years ago, when I started, there was nothing. Nothing. <laughs> there was nothing. Yeah, yeah. So, so things I, are improving. Yes. Yeah, things yeah. are really improving because the information was fairly much locked down in, in China. And we didn't have mm -hmm. access to it. And now because India has done so much research, we have a lot more we need to do it in the US. We need to do it everywhere because bamboos are site specific, right? What mm -hmm, I grow mm -hmm. here is not going to be the same as what you grow in Ecuador. You ha yeah. We have totally different soils. We have totally different environments. We have totally different bamboos, right? So Absolutely. each bamboo is, is, is very different in what it um, offers. They all have mm -hmm. silica. All parts of bamboo have silica and they all have silica. So even if some have a little bit more, and some have a little bit less. What I usually tell people is it's really, that's not the big criteria. The big criteria is just start using it and then and, go from there. And, and you mentioned earlier that um, the Bambusa vulgaris is not the ideal one for bamboo leaf tea because of uh, its composition, right? I mean, if mm -hmm. it, it is possible, but you have to cook it longer to be sure that uh, you won't have any issues. So I'm a big proponent of using bamboos that you have access to as opposed to buying something and having it shipped to you. First of all, mm -hmm. a lot of times, just in the whole supplement and tea industry, there's so much altered 
alteration of things and substituting of things. Yeah. And if you don't know what you're looking at, even if you do, it's so hard to discern. So I'm a big proponent of like using what you have available. Mm -hmm. If you only have bamboo sebulgaris available, I would cook it a really long time because it's higher in a toxin that's in bamboos called cyanic glycosides. Now, most of the bamboos, um, especially the, the running bamboos and in the bamboosas, which are the subtropical um, species that I grow, there's no cyanic glycosides, except for in a little bit in the bamboo sebulgaris. That's the one exception. Yeah, which, which is the most <laughs> common bamboo on the planet right now, right? Because everybody's like, oh, this beautiful golden bamboo. But golden bamboo, yeah, golden <laughs> yeah. Hawaiian. However, like you can use bamboo sebulgaris because uh, cyanic glycosides are heat dissipated. So that means if you cook it and you cook it long enough, you will dissipate the cyanic glycosides, which is a bitter sugar, a bitter sugar. And so, and the other thing is, uh, if you've ever tasted cyanic glycosides, it's not something you'll eat a whole bunch of that will ever hurt you because th there's no way you would do that. Like it kind of makes your mouth a little numb and it's really bitter and it just feels like something you shouldn't eat. So if you have that flavor from something, you just stop eating it. <laughs> you have choice over what you can eat. So just don't eat anymore. Okay. But like mainly like where we usually see cyanic glycosides is in the shoots. So mm -hmm. um, when you harvest you the shoots. Yeah, so cool. These are little so that's shoots. A, a baby bamboo or two baby these bamboos baby there. Bamboos. <laughs> How old these are, are they? Uh, How many well, days? This, this is end of season shoots so they're just throwing mm -hmm. up a few little pieces here and there um okay the australia I, wow so, but this is a little teeny tiny one and this is a this is a typical bambusa um shoot and so you have the the calm sheets and you know and then the shoot down here so um but yeah we're right at the end of the season so are, are you going to utilize it like cook it dehydrated or or uh what are you like yeah so my to favorite do with thing it? to do with all well, my favorite medicinal thing are just shelf stable thing because like so many things on a farm things come all at once right mm -hmm. so with bamboo mm -hmm. shoots here in florida they come generally between um may and august somewhere in that range mostly they're mm -hmm. done by september um, the, if you go into Georgia and you're doing like the temperates, Henan and Moso and things like that, they're going to come between about um, March to May, somewhere in that range. So they're a little ahead of us, even though they're further North, it's, it's a little mm -hmm. bit nuanced, right? And then, yeah. um, but we're on the same schedule as most of the tropicals that being opposite of like, if you go really far South, you go to Brazil or Australia then they're on the complete opposite spectrum of yep. us. So what I like to do is these have cyanic glycosides because they're a tropical bamboo. And mm -hmm. this is basically the microgreen of bamboos. So microgreens are like the baby plants of like broccoli or something like that, that you've seen at the farmer's market mm -hmm. or whatever. And they have all the nutrition consolidated down mm -hmm. into the really small amount think bamboo shoots as being the same way. These are going to grow up to be those things that you see behind me, but this mm. is it in a consolidated form. So all the nutrients, all the minerals, all everything is concentrated into the and, shoot. And Shanti, how yeah. do you know when to harvest it um, mm. regarding size? Or I mean, if it's like half, it depends on the bamboo or is it the color or uh, how, how do you say, okay, now, I want to harvest this shoot. Now it's too late. It's too early still. How do you know? <laughs> well, so they're all a little bit different, but if you let it go too much above this height, mm -hmm. usually the dendrocalamuses, you have a little more of flexibility, not much though. Um, if you go, let it go anywhere over eight to 10 inches, it, what happens is it starts to get fibrous down here and it starts to become the calm. So it's starting to harden off and elongate. And so mm -hmm. you want it when it's all consolidated down into the shoot. So usually you'll see it stick out of the ground about like here, and mm -hmm. then you kind of wait till it gets here and then you 
you can cut it off. This is actually just a little too far gone, even though it's, well, it's still usable. Because what will happen is when you cut this up, so you'll take all these off, which is the comb sheath. Mm -hmm. So this is the comb sheath. What's really cool about the comb sheath that I've just recently seen more studies about using the comb sheath. I've been doing it for years. But on the comb sheaths, you can use these to make tea. Oh. And they're very high in flavonoids. Flavonoids are the oh. antioxidants of bamboo, right? So yeah, yeah. there's lots of flavonoids in bamboo. Wow. And what's really cool, you can see like a chocolate. little bit. <laughs> like chocolate, like blueberries, like, chocolate. like yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so and bamboos are very high in anthocyanins specifically. The reason you can tell this, if you've ever harvested dendrocalamus species, different dendrocalamus species, they almost bleed red down the side. It's absolutely mm. incredible. The dark colors. Think like eat the rainbow, like dark mm -hmm. colors, like the pigments in blueberries and red grapes in, mm -hmm. you know, wow. the black and foods. By harvesting the shoots, you don't harm the plant if you cut it really low? Or how mm -hmm. is the stress for the plant if you harvest the shoot? What's the best way? Because I mean, the so, leaf is, is, is a leaf, but the shoot is like much more energy, right? For the plant, it's right. more, it, it, it's yeah. a bigger thing. Yeah. So the, the, the key to shoot production and how you manage your farm is based on whether you're doing shoot production or comb production. I mean, most people are doing a little bit of both, right? Mm -hmm. um, you want to harvest because it encourages the plant to grow. Like I said, these are working plants. If mm -hmm. you just let them grow and you never harvest on them, they will just kind of chunk along. But if you can, if you harvest on them, it actually promotes them to grow. So you want to keep them in this, like what's considered a juvenile state. And that juvenile state, think of an asper. Asper is a really big plant. Like we're talking, calm, I've harvested shoots that are like this big around, right? A giant bamboo. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a big bamboo. And you want to keep those to about six calms. That's incredible when you think about it. So if you know what the asper plant looks like, it's an incredible mm -hmm. thing to keep any plant to six columns. Um, these are old hami, and so they tend to stay a little bit smaller. But even with them, I'm constantly trimming them out. So you like the you want to keep them in that phase of like I want to grow, 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 and you want to hold them there. And the way that you do that is by keeping them. And so you want to harvest out, you know, depending on how many shoots they'll send out, they'll probably send, they can send upwards of, you know, up to 20 shoots, depending on the, the species and the, and the site and the nutrients. Bamboos grow to availability. So but you don't want to harvest everything at once, right? Because if you harvest more than 20, 25%, the stress mm -hmm. level for the plant is, is very high. Right. And this is more true for Guadua and temperates than it is for tropicals. So mm. tropicals are much more resilient around that. In fact, like when I dig bamboos, I have oftentimes dug bamboo, tropical bamboos, subtropical bamboos, bambooses back to like a 16th of the size. So like oh, wow. something that's like 10 feet across, I took down mm -hmm. to like maybe two feet across or one foot across. I left wow. that little piece. But if you leave that little piece, all of those fungal and bacterial relationships are intact. It mm -hmm. and you backfill it, it grows like it never missed a beat. It mm. just grows. If you take that piece out and replant it, it has to start all over again and it slows mm -hmm. way down. So it just is a good example of how important those relationships are, which which equates to Food for bamboos is mulch. That's mm -hmm. that's the number one food for bamboos is forest material, right? Yep. So in Korean ferments, they talk about fermenting and, and accessing the bacteria and the funguses that are partnering with specific plants on specific sites. And essentially, you know, that's a great way to do it. But the easier way is just feed it back mulch, mulch mm -hmm. or wood. Mm -hmm because those are fungal dominated and they will initiate those relationships and inoculate. That's what you're trying to do is inoculate the site. And so they become, you can call them like a nurse log or something, but 
doing that for bamboos really feeds them. Mm, wow. Yeah. Wow. So but going back to the shoot, you, you take off the calm sheets and you can see the anthocyanins. That's the red. When you get mm -hmm. to gender calamuses, you have way more of those anthocyanins and they're concentrated in the calm sheets. So making extractions, if you're going for the antioxidant part of bamboo, making an extraction mm -hmm. from the calm sheet is what you want to use because that's where they're concentrated. And then, mm. the, so all the different parts of bamboo can be used. You can use the roots, the shoots, mm. the leaves, the stems, the shavings from the outside of the comb, and the but inside. They're dry of the normally, comb. right? The shavings, they're rather dry. You can dry them, yeah. So yeah. The, the real concern that I have with when you start to make things with bamboo is that mm -hmm. you are respecting the cyanic glycosides, right? Respect the cyanic glycosides and, and process the material accordingly. So in the leaves, like I said, in bambusas, except for bambusa vulgaris, in bambusas have very little to absolutely non cyanic glycosides. So those mm -hmm. you could use directly and put them into like a tincture or make an extract that's an ethanol extract without having to worry that you might extract some of the bitter sugars, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The better way to do it is to have them break down a little bit because one of the keys of working with bamboo is that they're very fibrous. This is why mm -hmm. we can't do that. We can't eat them. You need four yeah. stomachs to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so break down, you mean fermentation or you mean so you, yeah. mechanical? So Right. So breaking down cellular structure can come in a bunch of different ways. It can come in a physical way through maceration. It can come in a heated way through like, think of making tea or heating mm -hmm. something. And it can come in a solvent way. What I try and do is I always do heat before I do any kind of solvent. So I'm always like pre digesting them essentially because bamboos mm -hmm. yeah. need to be pre-digested. They have long yeah. chain polysaccharides and essentially those are like super fibrous, but when mm -hmm. you start to break those down, you can roll them up and that's what creates the sugar. The mm -hmm. other way, there was a guy um, way back when and he kind of figured this out for himself, but the one way that you can do it too is you can actually like the traditional way of drying leaves and hanging them and, and mm -hmm. aging them. You can do that with bamboo because age is also another way to break down those long chain polysaccharides. And by doing mm. that, what happens is you turn those long chain polysaccharides into something that you can actually access, which is like a sweeter, like the sugars that come out. And so you lose mm. chlorophyll in that process. You'll get like something that looks more like a, you know, kind of like a, a brown color like this mm -hmm. is exactly. the color that it yep. turns into but you are accessing other aspects like the sugars and you still have all the minerals. Like I said, minerals are super stable. Like you could have bamboo 10 years from now and it would still have all the minerals in it. Like those aren't so, breaking down. Shanti, if I understand you correctly, you can harvest your bamboo leaves from the soil, even if they look, if they're there like for weeks or months, um, because they still have the minerals in the leaves. They'd have the minerals. They've lost some of the other things, right? So mm -hmm. you're give and take, but this is always true as an extraction process. For instance, if you're trying to extract silica and you're doing an alcohol solution, you're not getting any silica because silica is water soluble, right? So mm -hmm. if you want to do an extraction that is not using water, you would have to use glycerin because glycerin will extract water soluble elements. So my point is that the part of the bamboo that you extract how you extract it, what you extract it with, all have to do with what are you going for. If you're simply mm -hmm. going for minerals, you can pick these off the ground and they still have minerals because like I said, they're very stable for a long period of time. If you're mm -hmm. going for other elements like antioxidants or you know different polyphenols, then, it, then you would need to do different types of extractions and utilize more fresh material. Fresh. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah, but that's that pretty enlightening. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> and so, yeah, so you just keep going all the way down on these palm sheets until 
you get to something that looks more like this. And this is, you're gonna cook this for about 30 to 45 minutes, and then you can use it for anything, right? So the 30 to 45 minutes of cooking is because of the cyanic glycosides. So if you have bamboo in your backyard and you wanna utilize it, this is how you do it. Cook it for 30, 45 minutes, and then you can use it in soups and stews and everything. But my favorite, my favorite shelf stable way to use bamboos is to make a powder. And I'm gonna put this on. Dehydrated or? So it's What's cooked. Your... Everything it's cooked. with bamboo is cooked. Mm -hmm. And let's yeah, see. wow. Okay, there powder. But you Wait. cook it and then it's it's yeah. it's cooked. But then so you dehydrate it. Right. So this is essentially a superfood powder that has mm -hmm. all the minerals in it, and it has it has uh, high fiber. So bamboo also has um, copper. It has which is good for your brain. It has uh, riboflavin, which helps with the mitochondrial level that I said. It's got vitamins. It's got minerals. It's got it's it's a whole superfood. And so you can make this into a powder, and now it's shelf stable. So you can keep that and use it as a gluten free mm. flour. You can add it to your smoothies. You can do a whole bunch of to different everything. things with it. Yeah. Yeah. You, you so could even do bread. Have, you can do bread. You can do, well, <laughs> wow. it's, it's already being done, right? So this yeah. is how they make bamboo biscuits or things like that. Mm. And this is the way you do it. And so you take this and boil it, and then mm -hmm. you're going to mash it into a pulp, and then you're going to bake it at a low temperature until you can get it to a powder, you know, until you can get it dry enough to grind it up as a powder. And then you can keep it for long periods of time. You know, wow. it, it's very shelf stable. And so it's a way to use bamboo and keep it for a long period of time, but also have it in a format that's easy to access. So you mm -hmm. can access those nutrients back into your daily life uh, at ever, any given time. Um, so that that's an easy solution. The tea you can dry, and you know one of the easiest ways is sun drying it. Like I said, you can hang it up. Keep in mind that bamboo is very high in silica, and silica is a desiccant, meaning that it hold you know it holds moisture. So if you live in a mm -hmm. tropical area, it's going to be kind of spongy because mm -hmm. it's it's always going to keep absorbing moisture. So like where you live very hard to leave leaves like even dried yeah. leaves they just want to hold on to moisture because you just exactly. so much of it where i live too um, <laughs> not gonna happen there <laughs> yeah no yeah. so and where you'll see it is um when you try and and like cut it or grind it and stuff it's just kind of real spongy right so mm -hmm. to keep it as a shelf stable and, and you, you have keep, to keep the leaves you you keep the 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 head of the of the um branch right I like to use the stem and the leaves because I feel like you're accessing two different parts of the plant. The stems tend to have a higher concentration of silica in them. They need to be cooked a little bit longer. They are tougher. It's more like when you think of using bamboo, it's more like how you would use a bark or a root. So think like ginger, like you need mm -hmm. to heat it for a long period of time. It's not, it's the actual opposite of working with something like mint. Mint is like, you don't want to get anywhere near boiling with mint because otherwise you just lost everything. But with bamboo, mm -hmm. it's more like working with rooibos tea. Rooibos tea is very similar. You can actually put it through like your espresso machine. It can take that much heat. And in fact, it needs it to break it down. So I like to use all the parts of the bamboo. Um, and like I said, I, I like to cook them and have them cook them as much as possible. So you heat them, like whether whether you're drying in an oven or you're sun drying um, to utilize it that way and get it dry and then keep it stored. And then you're going to heat it again through making tea. Mm -hmm. So reheating it is no issue at all. That's really a good way to uh, to use it. And oftentimes a lot of medicinal properties are not accessed the first time around. So especially oh. with things like bamboo that have deep seeded um, mm -hmm. medicinal qualities, those things, it's like you only get them on the second and third time around, right? Wow. So 
it's actually better. Most people lose a lot of the medicine that they buy because they simply steep it and then throw it away. And mm -hmm. oftentimes you haven't accessed the real medicinal parts until the second or third time. So you, not, you not could use like, bamboos. so you can use the bamboo leaves like two or three times the same yes. ones. Yes. Ooh, okay. That's interesting. Absolutely. So, and the thing about bamboo, and this has to do again, back to the silica, like the silica thing is a huge silica, thing. Silica. Yeah. So it coats the inside lining of your digestive system. It is adding elasticity, like we talked about. It makes other materials more bioavailable. And this is really clearly seen in the history of bamboo because in Ayurvedic medicine and Chinese medicine, bamboo has been used for thousands of years. And so it's a cooling herb that takes heat out in Chinese medicine. Mm. And in Ayurvedic medicine, it has traditionally been used in almost every formulation of Ayurvedic medicine. And so it's not really talked about on its own because it's in with almost everything they do. And the reason is, is because it binds, silica binds other elements together, other elements being other plants, other nutritions and stuff, and acts like a delivery system. So it makes them more bioavailable. And so mm. it, it really is the backdrop to almost every formula that's made in Chinese and in Ayurvedic medicine. So it seems like the silica is like, the aluminum in modern medicine which which helps to bring back everything at one place but this is from nature so much much better than putting aluminum in our body to whatever and interesting you said that because silica binds with aluminum so one of the ways to get rid of heavy metals is to use is, silica and it's very well known like Think of like um, their Iraq war syndrome, right? That the people who had is essentially they had a toxicity in their brain and they determine it's from aluminum. And so mm -hmm. using silica to reduce and eliminate aluminum for your body, that's what, that's what silica does. It binds very strongly to mm -hmm. other elements and removes them. Wow. So you can do that through bamboo charcoal and you can do that through bamboo tea. Anything that has silica will remove heavy metals, specifically aluminum mm. from your body. And that's super that's interesting because all the, um, what is it, deodorants and all that stuff, all that brand stuff, all that, all that has aluminum to, to really get into the body, right? Well, so, aluminum uh, is also really well known to be a huge part of Alzheimer's. So yes, yes. And it, it makes sense because everybody is, is kind of using that in their daily life, right? Because it's like... Uh, Our body can't get rid of it on its yeah. own. It just builds up. So, and it can mm. cross the blood-brain barrier, which silicon can there. do also. And so it stays there and it accumulates in the fatty tissues and it'll mm. sit there and it just keeps building up until you get to a toxicity level that um, creates mental Illness. issues. Yeah. yeah. So well, that's one of so, the big things that bamboo so can do. So eat and drink bamboo as much as you can. Implement yes. that in any in your daily uh, um, um, diet if you can, yeah. and those of, of your dogs and and your other plants, right? I mean, uh, I mean this is like racehorses. Like racehorses is a great example, or a working dog. Dogs, mm -hmm. like animals that are working animals, need to have support around connective tissues and bone density. That's what silica mm -hmm. and these other minerals do. They're the building block of creating a bone that is not only stronger, but it's more flexible, right? Mm -hmm. This is what the animals are asked to do. They're performance animals, right? So mm -hmm. adding these minerals into the diets of performance animals, or any animal for that matter, is going to create a stronger and more resilient animal. And so the applications for this are, you know, pretty much endless. Wow. And it's, it's so mind blowing to me that it, it's absolutely not limited to humans. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. animals, other plants. I mean, this is true holistic uh, uh, application, right? I mean, there well, we see that it's really... Right. So the beautiful thing is like whether you live on a quarter of an acre or you live on a thousand acres, if you incorporate bamboo into your garden, you have access to all the things that I just talked about. 
for mm -hmm. your land, for your animals, mm -hmm. and for you and for your kids, right? Mm -hmm. And so remineralizing or adding minerals back into the soil is one of the biggest issues that we have in soil. So if mm -hmm. you're growing food, you want more minerals than that. Well, you've got your own bamboo producing mineral plant right here that you can utilize that to put back in. One of the best ones to use in the subtropics and tropics is to use fern leaf, which is a very small plant. So it's easy to chop and drop and to add back in, especially where you live with those really heavy clay soils. You want mm -hmm. to be adding a lot of organics back in there and, and trying to, um, I mean, like in here we have sand and it's kind of the mm -hmm. same issue, but very different. Like we dry out and we lose a lot of nutrients, but you have a lot of nutrients, but they're hard to access. And then you get a lot exactly. of water logging and things like that yeah. in both situations. Now, bamboo can be utilized because in my situation, the bamboo is holding the moisture in. It's mm -hmm. adding in nutrients, which are so quickly washed away through the sand and adding organic material in your situation. It's adding in organic material. It's covering the earth and adding in back in that carbon to try and break up the clay a little bit. And so it can be utilized in so many different ways. And then you can use it for yourself, for eating, for drinking, mm -hmm. for, and you know, if you're not into tea or you're not gonna harvest bamboo shoots, that's okay too, because you can take, even just go outside and pick a green bamboo leaf if you're if you're using like a bamboo so if you're using a philostachys and you have this plant that you're trying to get rid of in your yard or pseudosasa you know you might want to consider just eating it or yeah. using cool. it for feeding another animal whether it's a goat mm -hmm. or a horse or a cow but utilizing and it so you could use is... this cooking rice anything mm -hmm. and just put it and in that way it even more considering now that most vegetables and, and, and things we eat on a daily basis have like lower nutrients than like 50 or 100 years back. So actually this uh, thing to, to add uh, the bamboo somehow into the daily diet makes a lot of sense, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, so <laughs> utilizing bamboos in all sorts of different ways is really what they do best. So the, what I like to say is bamboos are abundant, they're successful, and they can be used to help other plants that maybe are struggling more, and they can be utilized to, you know, to add about diversity. And, and then also, I mean, there's the other thing, I mean, these are just the beginnings, right? They also like, they work with water. So they actually restructure water. So what we're having issues is lack of water and then a lot mm -hmm. of water they work exactly. both and and they work well in both situations when you have standing water they take the standing water and they move it much more quickly so they adapt immediately to situations and they mm -hmm. switch things around last year when we had the hurricane i saw some bamboos that were sitting underwater like seven feet up on them for three weeks that's a huge if you if you put me in water for three weeks I, i'd rot like that's, yeah. we don't do that but bamboos can do that so they yeah. sat there yeah. but in lower amounts of water what they're doing is they are transpiring that water and pushing it back up to the atmosphere at mm -hmm. enormous rates just huge amounts of rates way faster than what trees can do so they can mm -hmm. move water and restructure it and make it into living water because stagnant water that sits on the ground is no longer living. But once mm -hmm. you put it through the system of a plant and put it back up into the atmosphere where it needs to go, it's back now become cycle. restructured. Yeah. It's become restructured. We are water. Every, mm -hmm. Everything in this life is water. We are mostly water, right? So 85%? This is 85%. And then the other thing they do is they add back in oxygen. So like you're near a city street or you're near a highway or you're near something that has toxins, you can actually create a green barrier that will absorb those toxins or, or prevent them from coming into your space. Mm -hmm. And bamboos do that really well because they have so many leaves and they can process things very quickly. And like I said, silica binds to things in the cannabis industry, for instance, they put silica in their soil because silica will keep any heavy metals from actually going into the plant itself. So if you're doing a medical grow, you want to have silica in your soil because it will keep your medical grow clean, no matter what your soil is from. Mm, that's...
So oh. if you have a vegetable garden, do the, the bamboo tea and, and, and give some bamboo tea to the vegetable garden and it will even grow yeah. better, be healthier and uh, boost right. probably. You got a little bamboo tea here. So this is typical color. The colors of bamboo tea come in anywhere from like a light yellow to a dark brown. There's a, mm -hmm. a quite a variety. Guadua is a nice one that's right in the middle. Um, one of my favorites is sea breeze. I love sea breeze. Mm. It's bamboo smalangensis. It's a subtropical, but I've made it from like probably a hundred different varieties from everything wow. from Asper to Moso to whatever I have available. And, and what's your best-selling like, tea? Uh, well, most people don't ask about like the type of tea. It's just we're kind of still at the range of like whether I should drink bamboo tea or not. <laughs> really? Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, we're, I mean, we're still on the baby steps. Baby, okay. But baby you, you're, steps. you're selling different bamboo tea, uh, right? Or, or you just I have... Use mostly, I use mostly malangensis. Sometimes I'll mix it with fern leaf. Um, but mm -hmm. I've used mostly malangensis. That's my favorite. It's it's if I take bamboos and make tea, I've got from a dark brown to like a light yellow. Light yellow meaning old hami, I sudasasa japonica. Dark brown being like ventricosa, um, and then sea breeze is right in the middle. Textilises tend to be there too. So these mm -hmm. are I are subtropics. So these are my bamboos. Um, okay. Philistachys. Some of they'll range. Some of them will be, you know, I don't have a favorite Philistakis. Um, I have used Moso, so you know, maybe that one. Yeah. That's <laughs> because a good it's one. it's or is is Moso because it's it's like kind of known bamboo, like the Chinese bamboo Moso maybe or something. I like Asper a lot. Asper's got a really nice flavor, very green you know, mm. like green flavor. So they'll, um, you know, and it also depends the time of year that you harvest them. So mm -hmm. if you harvest something in the rainy season, that's not usually when I harvest. I harvest in the dry season because everything is more concentrated. Mm. So in the tropics Makes and sense. subtropics, I would focus around the dry season for harvesting. Although you work... at any time you'll have minerals. Do you also work with the moon phases or not so much? I do sometimes. I um, I like to harvest with the full moon, and I'll do other times too. So depending but, on what's possible, you know, right? <laughs> if I was going to be very strict, I'd harvest just at the full moon. Yeah, yeah. for sure, for sure. I do the, often make my tinctures, or like if I'm putting together um, different different extractions that i'm gonna sit for a while that are gonna extract for a while i'll often do that on the full moon yeah to get more That's and and knowing so much about all the benefits all the health benefits of bamboo don't you sometimes get like frustrated of people like uh, uh discrediting bamboo or or even like questioning uh not even consuming bamboo but like having bamboo in the garden or or i mean how do yeah. you manage that? How? <laughs> My biggest trending video on TikTok has like a million two views and it's mostly haters. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it's visibility. <laughs> it's visibility. That's it. It's, it's all, I work for them. <laughs> That's what I usually like to say, you know, and my whole thing is really about that bamboos form connections. Bamboos are very much about connecting people. And mm -hmm. it, it's a very good example of what silica does. It goes back, it all goes back to silica because okay. bamboos yeah. connect people and places and endeavors and beautiful things that people do in this bamboo community. And it links them all together, right? And so when people have a negative impression of it, it's usually, um, either uneducated or they've had a bad experience. And I, I, you know, that's valid. What mm -hmm. I would like to say is that bamboos are successful, you know, and that they can be utilized, you know, even running bamboos are what they do is they colonize an area. 
So mm -hmm. they don't, not unlike some grasses that can be problematic by seeding themselves like five miles down the road, bamboos don't seed themselves five down the road. When they do flower, which is not very often, those seeds are very heavy and fall. So they fall mm -hmm. right around where the bamboo was. Um, and it happens very time, seldom because depending on the flowering range, which can be over a hundred years. Right. Right. <laughs> Which I mean, is very bamboos, different to the grass. <laughs> yeah, the bamboos that are native to the United States, there's four different bamboos native to the United States. Those all flowered basically intermittently almost every year in mm. some way or another. So there, the Native Americans were very used to using those, those bamboos in weaving, in housing, in food, they used the seeds and they made teas from mm. the leaves. So they used all the different parts. We are now at 2% left of what once covered most of the Southeast of the United States. Wow. So it's yeah. not all lost. We still have 2% in the United States <laughs> regarding it's bamboo. 2%. <laughs> wow. and those were all running bamboos. Those were wow. all running bamboos. And so what's interesting is like, when the colonization started, the those people, they were afraid of the bamboo. It was places that they couldn't see what was happening. People, you know, Native Americans or other people would hide in them. You know, there, some of them are 20 feet tall. They were very dense. They were a forage that the buffalo and other animals ate and could also hide in them. And so the colonizers burned them down. Now, if we look at like the language that is negatively used around bamboo, it's still the same language right? It's still about fear and about, you know, uneducated uses of bamboos. So I think the biggest thing is just how to use it. And that's why, like, one of the things that I do is I help the American Bamboo Society facilitate an art contest every year, because people can't argue with art, right? <laughs> like, sustainable art is really hard to argue with. It just is. Just as, like, a superfood is very hard to argue with. An abundant superfood that you have in your backyard is also very hard to argue with. So trying to find those places where, you know, we can not argue. And so artists like um, Kenya Viva Italia, Margarita Bertoli, or like Nathaniel Holland, or like, um, he's out of Vietnam, Giuliano Sense and Zama Bamboo out of Brazil. These are people who are doing really, Gerard Mikanawa, I mean, he is an amazing artist out of the United States. These are all people who are utilizing bamboo in creative ways and showcasing beautiful things that you can do sustainably. And to me, that's one of the ways that we can move forward that people can't really give you too much pushback. So that's kind of how I navigate it. Cool. Yeah, I imagine it can be challenging knowing so much and, and well, being there where we are today, right? That like at the beginning, like if never, like if bamboo is something new for a lot of people, right? And it, it, it's not. I mean, there was like this bamboo age, like what was it, 20, 30,000 years ago where everything was kind of out of bamboo or whatever. And, uh, well, we're I think we're slowly... Uh, le relearning what what uh, we knew maybe back then already. <laughs> well, and I think when people get sick and people don't feel good and they find out that there's actually something that's growing near them that they can utilize, like for instance, bamboos help lower your cholesterol level because they have phytosterols that are that basically go into your body and they look to your body like a like a cholesterol and so they'll link onto that and then flush the cholesterol out so they help lower your cholesterol levels there's also things in bamboo that actually seek out floating glucose that's going through your bloodstream sugars that are going through that are not attached to anything and they help flush that out so if you know that you could utilize this plant to make you feel better then it might not be something that you're so angry at Right. Absolutely. It's just a matter of like if something is really like all of a sudden, you know, you don't have enough of it. That's the that's the opposite effect. Like if it becomes so useful, we don't have enough of it. And that's also where what the weird thing is, is in the bamboo, we're kind of in both at the same time. <laughs> we're like we both don't have enough bamboo and then we have a whole bunch of people who think we have way too much bamboo. Right? Exactly. That's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
So yeah. to yeah. me, that's about education. So I try and do mm-hmm. gateway projects, projects that allow people to access it without too much work. So you want to take bamboo leaves and put it in your rice and add more minerals to your life. Let's just start there, right? Let's start step there. Step by step. <laughs> step by step. Yeah. yeah. Eat your bamboo. If there's too much of it, eat it. Make pickles from it. Make this yeah. gluten-free powder. You can make a tea from it. You know, that's what I do. But you can utilize this plant or you can chop it all down and give it to the guy down the street who has horses because it's remineralizing those horses, right? Or goats or things like that or all sorts of animals that can eat bamboo. So somehow the bamboo is is kind of similar uh, and makes me think uh, to vetiver grass, which has also holds a lot of minerals because it has so, but it's different, very different, but it's also a grass. So they're both kind of in the same kingdom, right? But um, yeah, regarding so, the minerals? Well, vetiver grass, first of all, it's not a forage because it's very serrated. So no animals mm-hmm. will eat it. What it's really well known for is the roots. The roots are amazingly aromatic. Like they're just incredible and it's drought tolerant and it helps. You can also grow it in really wet or really dry areas. In really dry areas, it has this massive root system. So it's good for erosion control. The first time I worked with vetiver was like 30 years. One of my first jobs was to work with it. We had a project in Egypt um, utilizing it for for restoration around, you know, erosion control in really arid areas. And Classic so that's use case. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I, that's been used like that forever. Um, I just had a guy recently come to me, it was a couple of years ago, actually now, from Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rico, what, um, this happens all the time. So they specified 70,000 plants for a DOT project. And at the same time, they put vetiver on the invasive species list. So I was like, I was like, so he had to buy all of them kind of on the down low. But the thing mm-hmm. is, is vetiver is not an invasive species, just like no. bamboo is not an, you know, bamboo yeah. should not be considered an invasive species. It should be considered a colonizer that's underused. But in vetiver's case, it's not even that. Yeah. Like you can't propagate it except by division. And it's exactly. a clumping It's a lot of work. Grass. It's a clumping <laughs> it's a grass. Right. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. it's, there's no yeah. way that's an invasive species. It's just really yeah. under, undereducated, but it's used all across like Central America and Asia for erosion control. Yeah. And so these are plants, like as we move forward in the future and we're thinking about how we can be more resilient around farming, utilizing bamboos for farming is really, really key. Regenerative agriculture needs to include bamboos. And so in all types of areas. And Mm -hmm. it needs to include them for all the things that we just talked about, specifically in those areas for like windbreaks, forage, and and increasing the quality of meat in animals. That, that, okay, yeah, makes sense also. And maybe having less animals, but better quality meat, which would make sense, Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Yeah. You don't need to have as much if you do a better job at it. I mean, the two big areas that are being talked about in regenerative agriculture is whether we're going in and the the truth of the matter is we're going in both directions. You're going to be going in high tech, creating Mm -hmm. food and laboratories, and you're going to be going in growing local regenerative agriculture on a smaller scale, right? That's Mm -hmm. more local, less waste and more diverse. Right. And so mm-hmm. the truth of the matter is we're going to be doing a little bit of both. Actually, we're going to be doing a lot of this techie one, which is to me quite terrifying. Right. Um, so more profits there at the beginning and long term. probably. Profit, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so the idea is on this techie one is that you can rewild areas of big ag back into wilderness, whether that mm-hmm. is actually true or not is still yet to be seen regardless. In the smaller we'll regenerative agriculture scene, <laughs> bamboos can be highly utilized there. To um, and for uh, you know, in the colder climates, you've got a forage that can be grown all year round, right? So it stays mm-hmm. green in the winter time. Yeah, yeah, that's um, a big, also like mental uh, uh, positive point because all those uh, cold climates where we have like everything is sleeping in winter, right? So everything is is dead, no leaves, but bamboo is always green. And, and yeah. green makes you feel well. You feel like balanced, you're, you're better with green. <laughs> it's that easy. So, right? 
right? Like one of the things I like to talk about when I do events is that what is it that you feel when you're around bamboo? And people will usually say like what you say is like feels calm. I feel, you know, it makes me feel relaxed. Um, exactly. Anti-anxiety. Like I just feel better. And so what's really interesting is that actually is one of two terpenes that's coming out of bamboo that comes down just in spending time with bamboo. Wow. So, just, so it, it interacts in real time there and, and, and yes. like changes how you feel. Yeah. Yeah. So these terpenes are um, chemicals that the plant uses to protect itself, but also uses to communicate with other plants. And they're literally in the sky and we can breathe them in we can absorb them through our skin um and one of them is myrcene which is what bamboo is known for and bamboo myrcene is known as something that makes you feel calm and collected mm -hmm. and grounded and so we know that spending time in bamboo there's been studies already spending time in bamboo reduces anxiety it increases mental clarity and improves brain function and it feeds your immune system this is all just through being around bamboos bamboo. and so yeah. utilizing bamboos in churches schools assisted living facilities nursing homes and hospitals in therapeutic gardens is re yeah. another really important aspect because you don't even have to eat them to get therapeutic you can just have them there around you, you. can just <laughs> breathe it in and you're breathing in extra oxygen as wow. well right as they yeah. produce a lot more oxygen more than very the other. Yeah. they provide yeah. habitat for birds so they add that element and so all those reptilians things reptilians too <laughs> reptiles sometimes yeah, yeah. <laughs> More so, we're, we're, we focus on the birds here, so okay. <laughs> we don't have as many of the others. But um, it, there's a, just a lot more benefits that you can get from visually looking at them. Actually, helps your eyesight because that green and the diversity of textures will help mm -hmm. improve your eyesight. But it also helps with healing processes. So there's been lots of studies around therapy in hospitals and people healing needing less pain medication when they have access to green spaces and bamboos mm. can be a part of this whole process wow wow so this who doesn't um, need more mental clarity i mean yeah, we have yeah. a huge mental crisis in the united states a huge mental health crisis worldwide and a lot of it worldwide and a lot of it could be solved by just spending more time outside in bamboos mm. just that alone yeah. 20 minutes a week is enough to last you even just that little teeny amount is enough to just barely last you for the week long there's so many studies that show that you know at, at 20 minutes how much benefit you get from breathing in those terpenes and extra oxygen and just being around plants and how beneficial that is and bamboos do that on like at a far greater level than any other plant wow Wow. So Shanti, um, we're slightly over time with one okay. hour and something, but uh, it has been truly very, very insightful. Um, I hope the viewers also will be uh, truly appreciating all this trove of information regarding uh, the, the, the added value or however we call it of bamboo. Um, and um, wow, I just have like, 10 new ideas in my head right now <laughs> yeah. so yeah and I, I i hope that this um helps to inspire a lot of other people um and um i will publish a, a blog article uh where i'll also link your website um where um it should be very easy for people from the us also to order the bamboo leaf tea and many other products you're selling there. Also, um, consultation services regarding regeneration, not limited to bamboo, but also for sure with bamboo. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was uh, really uh, very interesting. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, thank you, JJ. I so appreciate you taking the time and you know just putting so many so much great information out there. Like I've listened to every single one of your podcasts. So, and it just is wow. so helpful 
it helps me get to know what other people are doing and then and get to know them a little bit better you know we're not a very big family and to see all the amazing things that people are doing is is really a gift so thank you so much well thank you for your time i mean this is possible because you also are giving your time and i i think it really added value also in this case to at the bamboo knowledge which is kind of hard to to get but as you mentioned before it's getting better and better so hopefully yeah. this podcast will also be part of uh, helping people to better understand better um, um, use bamboo in future and and be healthier and happier yes <laughs> yeah yes you want <laughs> making all this of place that. a better uh, place for everybody <laughs> small Fantastic. actions right we spiral out <laughs> exactly it's, it's it's really about that and if we think about it i mean everything is here we just need to connect the dots and and, and use it right um yes that's it yeah Fantastic. and i think that's what people are looking for you know people are really looking for actionable steps that they can take that make sense and so mm -hmm. really small increments that you can make in your life make huge differences over long periods of time and even short periods of time. So just taking a few steps in one direction can change your whole trajectory. And, and understanding and knowing what the small steps are and what their impact mm -hmm. is and where you're heading. And um, I think a lot of what you, you told us now really helps understand, hey, it's really worth drinking and, and, and eating bamboo. It, it helps. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, fantastic. It's the building block of who you are. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's the silly, silica, silica. So the, the blog title will be something like, something with silica, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is like, this has really shown that is is the, the most uh, central uh, part of, of uh, uh, yeah. But I'll, I'll have to uh, do some uh, thinking there, but it has to do something with silica for sure. I'll come yeah. back to you before I, I have it then. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic, awesome. Shanti. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.